Last week, we were focusing on the revenue cycle. We looked at it in detail. And I spoke about how important it is for you guys to be able to understand the functions within the cycles, be able to know which line item the cycle affects. And also, I've mentioned that you should be able to identify risk, know the risk, know the control activities within the cycles um, and who actually performs it and why. The why comes with the audit objective, I mean the control objective. So it's the same thing that we'll be looking at today. However, it's just that the difference is the different cycle, it's the acquisition and payment cycle. So in today's class, we're going to look at the activities and functions within this cycle. We're going to look at the documents used in the cycle, the risks and internal control in the cycle, and the computerization part of the cycle. Just like with last week, we looked at both the manual and the, the manual and also the computerized controls. So same thing as I've mentioned, it's just that the difference is that we have, um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a different cycle that we're looking at. Okay, cool. So, activities within the cycle. You have to understand that um, there are two main activities within the cycle. Acquisition cycle has to do with your expenses side of your income statement. So, and normally when you make an, an expenditure for your business, it will be when you're doing your ordering and receiving of goods from suppliers, okay? And the other activity is that after making those goods and uh, ordering, I mean, after ordering those goods and receiving them from your suppliers, you have to make a payment, right? So that's why it's an acquisition and payment cycle. You acquire the goods, you receive them from your suppliers, and you have to make payments. So always remember that that is the two main activities within the cycle. And the functions within the cycle is that when you make these transactions, the two main ones, um, let me just use a laser point. When you make these two main activities, they fall within this functions and these are the functions and this is for a credit purchase meaning that you would have a payable at the end of the day it's buying goods on credit so you would have an ordering of goods that will happen the receiving of those goods happening you would have to record the purchases that you've made and prepare for the payment and then thereafter pay and record that you've made the payment these are the top five things that will be all railing around when it comes to this acquisition cycle. And please bear with me. The first few slides, as you've, if you, as you've seen even with the previous classes, it's a bit of theory, but then we will get to a point where we look at the activities and then you guys will have to speak. And let's participate. All right. Thanks. And after understanding what I just mentioned about the two main activities within the cycle and also the functions that occur within the cycle, you would then now need to think of for each respective function that we have, the top five that I've mentioned, what documents are there and are involved? And if we look at it, and this is not to say that these are the only documents involved, but these are the main ones that we see coming and being often used in companies, okay? So, the ordering of goods function would be a thing where there's a requisition of order and also, so there will be a request. We Let's say we use a stationary company, I mean a company that needs stationary, you find that you have to make a, a request to say that we need so and so pens and 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 these pencils someone would ask you why do you need them so on those requisition forms it's normally to um indicate what is it that you need 
and why do you need it? And what will it be used for, right? So that's a requisition. So just say it's a request form, right? Then thereafter, once let's say that the requisition is approved, it will come to a point where now there's a purchase order form that needs to be filled up. Okay, so you'd make up that you would write and be descriptive in terms of the description and the quantity. Thereafter, um, after filling in those forms, those two important forms, comes the point where now you receive your goods. Now, when you're receiving your goods, think about the warehouse. You've made the order. Now, the delivery guy comes in from the supplier and they bring those pencils to you. When they come, they will give you a delivery note that you will have to look at and check that whatever that was in your order form is also in the delivery note and it's also in good condition. I mean, good condition. Then they will also issue you, you will also have this good received note to show that the supplier can also have a copy to see that, okay, fine, they were received. Okay, so it's just to say that they were delivered and they were received. Thereafter, we'll be recording of purchases. The recording of purchases is now to indicate that these two things happen. You made an order, you received the goods, then they give you a purchase invoice. This is now to say that um, so-and-so company, you guys had made an order of five pencils and we delivered them on this day and here's your invoice. So the invoice comes in, it's a purchase invoice that we will use for recording this purchase and also will be used in terms of the amount that needs to be paid. Then there's a credit note that will be issued should there be any issues in terms of whatever that you received versus what you ordered. Then now, and I'm explaining these documents, guys, um, with the purpose of ensuring that you understand what these forms, not these forms, these documents are used for. Because when you understand those, you, it's easier to contextualize and make it practical for yourself uh, regarding, um, what's this thing? regarding uh, the control activities that are within each of these functions. So it's very important that you understand what each of these documents is used for. Then payment and preparation. So now after we recorded the purchases, the payment, we need to prepare that payment preparation. That's when there will be a creditor statement to show that this is the amount that you are liable for and also a check or payment requisition. Now, after getting that statement of indicating that this is your balance brought forward, if there is any, these are the purchases that you've made for the specific month, this is the amount that is due. After that, you have to now make a requisition to say that I need payment, checks are no longer even being used, but payment requisition to say that we need to make payment for what just occurred and the payment and recording of that pay of that payment um these are the documents that are involved the remittance advice your electronic payment eft i'm, I'm saying that um checks are no longer be used um at the moment i know with the bank we discontinued them so checks are no longer being used but then um your payment at the time, it was either through check or electronic payment, then you get your proof of payment or your receipt, but that's like just showing that you've made the payment. Okay, any questions before I move to um, risks? Are there any questions, guys? I'm gonna take your silence as no questions. Okay. So pretty much straightforward. Let's then go back to the presentation. Mm. Sorry, let me do that again. Okay, cool. Laser pointer, cool. 
Um, I hope you guys can see my screen. Then thereafter, now, now you understand what are the main what are the main activities within the cycle. You understand that there's certain functions within the cycle, and within those functions, what are the documents that are being used and why do we use them? Now, after understanding those, and, and, and yes, I am doing a summary, you guys will have to read what's inside your textbook. It will be detailed in terms of under those functions, what actually happens. You then need to start thinking about the risks and internal controls in the cycle. And as I've mentioned last week, a risk is to say what could go wrong if this control was not there, right? And control activities are the ones where we have to ensure that your control is added to prevent the risk or to detect the risk, right? Um, and, 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 and yeah, so it's important that you know the controls and also know what are they trying to achieve. After then, ask yourself, what could go wrong when this um, control was not effective or playing to um, playing to what why it was there, right? But the thing then risks, as I've mentioned, the acquisition phase of cycle attempts to ensure that a company orders and receives goods only, I mean, orders and receives only those goods that require, that it requires, and that the goods are suitable in terms of quality and price. That's ideal. Even with you, when you are making an order online would take a lot, you are hoping that what you're buying is what you require, right? Um, unless you're a shopaholic, but in most instances, you would think about it to say that, you know what, it is cold. I don't have a gas heater. I, not to say, I don't have a heater at first. Then you start debating. This is like part of requisition part for yourself. You'd say that which one is it um, cost effective? Is it an electric one or is it a gas heater? You start looking at the prices. You start thinking about the consequences of you buying that heater. Then let's say, for instance, as an example, you choose a gas heater. So you're saying that I require this gas heater, this good, because it will provide me with heat during the cold weekend, for instance. Then, fine, that's tick number one. Then you make the order. Then after you make the order, you're hoping that you will get a quality heater that will work immediately once you put the gas cylinder on that is of good quality, and the prices I've mentioned, you're paying for good quality. It goes along with what you saw and take a lot. They don't just get into your bank account and duplicate the payment or you paying you paid something wrong. So even with companies, it's the same thing. That's the main thing that they want to ensure that within the cycle and the controls that are in, we just want to ensure that the goods is what we require and the goods are of quality and of price. This thing would also like, let's say, um, if you are going to get into auditing, um, you find that when I'm talking about the requirement, it's very important that it's of, it's of a good need, like there's a good motivation for it. With most of our parents' data or even companies, you might find that there's certain expenditures that they make which were fruitful, uh, fruitless and wasteful. We call them fruitless and wasteful expenditure. That is one of the risks of saying that you made certain purchases that were not required. You know, there's a certain parastel statal that we know where they bought certain components of the train that don't even fit into our trains, but they were already paid and requested. So you find that those things are part of fruitless and wasteful expenditure because there was no need for you to be going out securing those goods. So even with yourself, you can also say that for this month, 
let me look at what I've purchased. Was this really necessary or was it a fruitless and wasteful? It starts there. And by the time you get into a company, you apply the same thoughts. Okay. The second phase of the cycle attempts to ensure that only goods that have been validly ordered and received are paid for. They don't want a situation whereby you have paid for certain goods, but you haven't received them. Or you've paid for certain goods, but they were not ordered accordingly, you know? And that's when you will have irregular payments that are being made. So I'm just giving you a risk that relates to this. We see it also in a lot of companies when you audit. You will see a lot in parastatals or even private companies to say that this certain goods were there, they were paid for, but you can't trace them as to the, where did they go. So those end up being fictitious expenditure and it affects the pockets of the company. And also, they want to ensure that that payment is authorized, accurate, and timeless. I mean, timeless, sorry. So we just want to make sure that the relevant people authorize it, and it's an accurate order that we are paying for, and it's within the time frames that we said that we will pay for. So these... Uh, whatever control that will be within the second phase of the cycle is to ensure that um, we avoid irregular payments. So I hope that makes sense for you guys as to why we would have those controls, right? And um, okay, cool. Then within these functions, you would look at the function you would look at the document and you will look at the internal controls. So we're just going to look at this. This is also in your module. And I just thought that it was a nice teaser as to when we are starting off. Okay. So within the function of ordering, there will be an initiation of orders, right? That's the first thing. As I've mentioned, you want to make an order. Then... For you to say that you want an order, I've mentioned you don't go straightly to the to the order form. You have to now start um, requesting for whatever that you want to order, right? And in this instance, it will be a requisition form. You fill it in. And then how do you fill it in? Because remember your controls, they govern how you move around in terms of determining um, um, the processes that you need to follow. So your internal controls will say that before the order is placed, a senior buyer or supervisor should check the order against the requisition for accuracy and authorization. Do you see that from here, they indicating when and who, and what is it that they want, they need to do, and why. I hope you guys understand what I'm saying. I'm trying to, uh, let's see with the pen. Yes, it's indicating the time, it's indicating who, and it's indicating what they need to do against what and why. So it's very, very, very important, guys, that. This is how you answer. We need to, even if you can put it on your side to say that time, yes, I understand time, I get it. But in most instances, we want to know who, sorry for my writing, it's, it's who, how, or what, let's say what they need to do. It's who, what, Right, sorry for my handwriting. Who, what, and why? It will help you to ensure that you answer your questions fully. Okay, who must do whatever that needs to be done, and what is it that they need to do? So, the supervisor needs to check the order against the requisition. Normally, the what part. It has to do with the documents. Okay. 
So you'd say, hey, they must check or verify. Um, I like, honestly, yes, they say, don't say check, you must say verify. So there's certain languages that you will pick up once you do auditing. But anyway, you, you must ensure that the supervisor senior buyer checks the order against the requisition form. So one, two. Why? For accuracy and authorization. Okay? So that's, I'd say that's number one of the control. Then number two starts here where they say that then thereafter checking this, they must review the order for suitability of supplier, reasonability of the price, quantity, and nature of the goods being ordered. I'd say that this is number two, right? Because it's saying that the supervisor, it's the who part, the supervisor, what is it that they need to do? The what starts here to say that, ah, uh, it's not here, sorry, it's here. They must review. What is it that they need to review? They need to review that order. Why? To check suitability of the supplier. Is the price reasonable? Is it the correct quantity and the nature of the goods? I hope that makes sense for you guys. Um, in terms of what I just mentioned now, how you need to answer your questions. Let it be that you don't make us guess. Uh, guessing is not fun. Guessing is not nice. So do not always assume that the marker understands audit so therefore they will make sense of what you write if it doesn't make sense to you when you're writing don't uh, expect it to make sense for the person who's marking so ensure that you, you show that you understand and you've got a methodology as to how you answer cool and don't cram your controls make sense of your controls number two the ordering department should file it's who the ordering department should file requisition uh, sequentially and should frequently review. So that's number one. They're saying that make sure that the order department files these requisition. Told you it's normally your what goes with your documents. The who is the ordering department should file the requisitions sequentially and and why normally sequentially you do it so that you achieve completeness so you could have added sequentially for uh, sequentially for completeness you know and then number two and says that and they should frequently review these files for requisition which have not been cross-referenced to the order that's a full, full, full um, answer just to do with initiation of an order. I hope that makes sense for you guys. Then number two, that's number one. Number two, under ordering, Placing orders with suppliers. Okay, so now we've covered the initiation of the orders. Now we're placing the order with suppliers. So under placing orders with suppliers, that's when you will have the purchasing order form. Because you firstly need to request, then that's when the order form comes into play. So what are the controls? The order clerks, it's the who part should not place an order without receiving an authorized requisition and should cross-reference to order, should cross-reference the order to the requisition. So it's who and what they should, right? The stores or production personnel, it's the who part, that's number two, should confirm that the goods are really needed. Okay, then the company should have an approved supplier list to which the buyer sh should refer when ordering. So, 
you can't just choose anyone in terms of supplier. You would have a dedicated, um, not a dedicated, you'd have a list of suppliers that you can order from because normally in that list, they make sure that you are tax compliant, VAT compliant, um, BEE compliant, and also going concerned. So you 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 ensure that whoever that you are buying from is reliable, right? And a copy of that order should be filed sequentially, and that file should be sequence checked and frequently cross reference to the receive order. I mean receive notes. Then blank orders should be subject to sound stationary controls. So this was a bit of a mouthful, but I'm hoping that just going a bit slowly with you guys in terms of what what form of answers are required from you, you will start answering that way. So now let's start. We are going to look at activity. Let me see. Yeah. Uh, now I've been talking. Um, now it's your turn to talk. Okay, guys, um, let me just remove this. It's time for you guys to, do you want to discard this card quickly? Now it's time for you guys to start talking to me. We'll be looking at activity four. I hope you guys can still see my screen. Um, activity four. It's a bit of a mouthful, but I want us to do it correctly. We've got enough time. I've tried to cover the theory. Now we need to start applying our minds so that we ensure that we understand the cycle. And as I've always mentioned, it's important that you participate in here. Practice in here as opposed to practicing when you're at home. Because being, I mean, not at home. Um, Practice in here so that when you get to the exam, you know what you're doing. Most people will study and then start practicing tests when they are in the exam. And that's that's a problem. We cannot afford such. Okay. So now I'm going to look, we're going to look at activity four. I'm going to read for you guys the first part and also number one. Then after reading number one, we go to what is required and you guys answer. Then we go to number two, we answer the required, and so on and so forth, until we get to number five. Okay, so at first you can brainstorm before you answer, just to say that this is what I'm thinking, but then I will tell you guys as to how you need to answer, because I want you to practice answering like you writing, because how you talk, that's how you write. Um, so I want you to practice that, then you will polish it. So when you're polishing it, I'll say formalize the answer. And it doesn't mean that if someone has brainstormed, they always have to formalize. Anyone can come in and formalize the answer for us. It's group work, okay? Cool. So let's start with the activity four. So Del Mundo PTY Limited, it's a small manufacturing company, very small. The company's accounting functions are carried out by the accounting staff, okay? And who's in this staff is an accountant, Uhu, and her name is Mary, and two clerical assistants, Stella and Dean, okay? So they're telling you about the people who are in the accounting function. The new owner of the business, John, is concerned about a number of processes that have been followed. And not having a business background has asked you to review and report on certain things, on certain, and report on certain of these processes. Okay. So, John is the business owner. They've asked you to review. You, the audit person, expertise. You must re review his process and give him feedback in terms of the processes that he's not comfortable with, that he's got concerns around. 
However, his immediate concern is the control over the payment of creditors. So think about those functions that I've mentioned. There's the ordering, there's the receiving, there's the preparing of the payment. So now, and, and after preparation of the payment, there's the payment itself. So he's not, I mean, he says that, yes, there's other processes with the company that I'd like you to look at, but the one that is top number one on my priority is the payment of creditors. To gather first-hand knowledge of how the system currently works, John himself compiled an accurate description of the system itself, which he gave it to you. So um, John gave you a description of the system. So let's look at what the system, this is what John gave you about the system. And remember, you need to review what he said and give him feedback in terms of the current processes that they have. Okay. So um, let me just give you a tip. Normally, when this is the situation whereby you didn't have to write the system, but the system was given to you, it's an indication before you even get to the required that you might be, I'm saying you might, I'm just saying get, be able to identify triggers. You might be asked to find weaknesses in the process and you might be asked to give recommendations. Normally like that, um, but then let's see. When an invoice is received from a supplier, I, I like highlighting when you're reading, don't just read, don't just read for the fun of it. When you read, when you know how you need to answer, you know what to look out for when you're reading. So I'm saying that certain things of saying who uh, reports, what is required, if you get what I mean. So here I'm just identifying the documents as I'm reading, right? So they're saying when an invoice is received from a supplier, it is promptly entered into the purchase journal. And this purchase journal is done by who Stella. And it is filed alphabetically by the supplier's name. So that's number one. There's an invoice. Whenever they receive an invoice, it is promptly entered into a purchase journal by Stella. Who is Stella? Stella is one of the clerical assistants. Okay. When the supplier's monthly statement arrives, another document. Here it is. When the supplier's monthly statement arrives, Stella, same person again. The clerical assistant agrees the invoice received, that invoice, to the statement. Okay. She also checks that any payment that were made to the supplier by Del Muno are reflected on that statement. Okay. So Stella does the purchase journal. Then Stella, when it arrives, she agrees the invoice to the statement, and she also checks for the payments that were made by the company to the supplier. All right, so I hope I've made sense out of it for you guys for we'll mentioning it after a while. So now they say that identify the witness. So you must take out what is that witness in whatever that I just read. So in the payment system described by John, that's the first thing that you need to do. Identify the witness. And for each witness you identify, you must explain. You must explain briefly why you consider this to be a witness. What a witness, what can go wrong? So in your explanation, you need to tell us that why you think this weakness, I mean, whatever that you identified is a weakness and what could go wrong because of this weakness. So remember what could go wrong means risks. So 
what they're saying is that after what I just read, with the invoice coming in and Stella preparing, immediately she prepares the journal. And then thereafter, she files it alphabetically by the supplier's name. Cool. Then the supplier statement arrives. Stella agrees that statement to the invoice. After she checks if the payments that were made by the supplier are reflected on that statement. So from what I've said, is there any weaknesses that you guys identify in this process that I, that I just mentioned around Stella? And if so, tell me why you think that it's a witness. What is the risk attached to that witness? Okay. What is the witness in what I've said and why you think it's a witness? Oh, can you hear me? Mm -hmm. uh, I think uh, uh, the witness uh, could be if uh, we will need a supplier what a delivery node. Why? Why is it? It could be our witness because we cannot just pay without uh, confirming if uh, maybe we've got the right goods or what. Because uh, some people might order for themselves, especially if the the, the order was not uh, maybe checked and authorized by the uh, supervisor. And also we need to have a purchase order number so that we'll know that uh, we'll pay against uh, the correct goods. If maybe we've got the back orders so that we'll know that, okay, we'll pay uh, the invoice that was sent it goes according to what we have uh, received okay so from what i'm understanding so what okay so maybe let's get back to this i understand that so, so you say <laughs> yes. i want us i like what you say so yes. you say that a weakness in this system is that Stella is not checking the invoice against the order. Yes, and the good receipt note. Okay, and the, so against the order and also against... And the delivery note, yes. Against the goods. Yes. So you're saying that Stella is making the payment without checking if we receive these goods. And then she might pay the... But I don't know why... Is, what is she going to pay against what? Because she needs to compare so that uh, she will know that everything is accurate. And why Why do you think that this is a weakness? Because she might pay for the wrong goods or they, they might even order for themselves and then, because I don't know what she's paying for, if she, she, she doesn't have that three documents uh, to can compare with. Okay. Yeah. All right. Thank you, Pavato. Anyone yeah. who sees anything different from what Pavato has mentioned? So feedback from the activity. They say that the invoices received from the suppliers are not matched to any other documents, namely the purchase order, the supply delivery note, or good receipt note. That's a weakness, right? And that's what Pavato has mentioned, that before she makes a payment, she's not comparing the invoice to any purchase order or good receipt note or supplier delivery note. That's a weakness being identified. And you can see that after they've done that, they just make a full stop. It's number one. Then they say that Del Muno could be, so now you are answering why you think that this is a weakness. Del Muno could be paying for goods which were never ordered or never received or are incorrect in terms of your quantity, description, and price. Okay, so we're happy with the answer to say that um, Babat was saying that they could be paying for the wrong things or to the wrong supplier because the people within could be, um, they could be making orders for themselves. Okay, so I'm happy with that. 
and and we used invoice and we 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 spoke about payment being made that they might be to the wrong people and for not matching that part of saying your invoice to the documents prior to that invoice, which are your got goods received note, your supply delivery note, and also your order form might result in us getting incorrect quantity, incorrect description, um, or even goods that were never ordered nor received. Okay, cool. Number two, if an invoice reflected on the statement has not been received. Stella highlights the invoices and marks them outstanding on the statement. The full amount reflected on the statement is paid. When the outstanding invoice is received, it is filed with the statement to which it relates to, and the outstanding mark on the statement is crossed out and dated. So now we continue. So now Stella received the statement. She would look at the invoice and check if it goes along with what's on the statement. If she doesn't find that invoice in that statement, she will highlight, oh, no, 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 this is an instance where there might be an invoice on the statement, but we haven't received that invoice, okay? So now she would highlight that specific invoice and mark it as outstanding, but pay the full amount that's on the statement. Then thereafter, once the invoice is received, she will file the statement with the invoice and then rub it off on the statement to say that we now have received it, okay? What witness do you guys, weakness do you guys identify and why? Can I go again? <laughs> <laughs> the last time that you go, we then need to give others a chance. Yes, you may. Okay, okay, I'm last time, okay. Anyway, I, I was working for, for, for creditors, it's fine, so maybe. <laughs> That's why I'm answering. Because you, you cannot pay for the invoice without, uh, you You will need to compare your age analysis against your statement. And then from there, you can't pay for that invoice because you don't know what you're paying for. Right. I think it can be the money that, uh, uh, you know, they won't be able to allocate because you don't know what are you paying for. Okay, so let's try to formalize what you're saying. So it's, what is the weakness in what you just mentioned? It's for incorrectly goods uh, being paid. But that's the risk. What is the weakness that you identify from their system? Meaning, from what they are doing, what is it that they are doing wrong? They cannot make a payment before... Uh, they can match everything against uh, the orders. I don't know if maybe I'm correct. Anyone would like to help and formalize what Babat was saying? Um, on my side, I think they cannot uh, make a payment without the, um, the creator statement, um, without receiving the creator statement. But they have a statement, remember guys, they've got the creditor statement. On that okay. statement, they see an invoice, but they haven't received it. And what they do, they end up paying the full amount that is on that statement. And then once they receive, and then, and then on that statement, they write outstanding, right? And once they receive that invoice, they, they cross that outstanding out. So, Karabo, you were saying? Okay. Um, I think they shouldn't pay that amount before they receive the purchase invoice, right? To show that they've purchased that goods, yes. Please repeat that, Karabo. 
I'm saying they shouldn't, the weakness, right, is they don't have pitches in voice on their side that correspond with the creator's statement. Okay. To show that the, to show that whatever that is on the creator's statement correspond with what they have, what they've got. Because okay. um, the creators can just create an amount and then they pay that amount without verifying if they did order those things. Okay. So you saying that their issue here, the issue that we have here, which is a weakness, is that they are making payments that are not traceable to an invoice. Yes. Right? And why do you think that this could be a problem? Um, because let's say uh, the person forgets to, to go back to the invoice or the invoice get uh, lost and all that, and you don't check if you, you got those invoices. Uh, man, the, the money in the, in the company is already gone and we have lost money for things that we did not, for, okay, for documents that we did not confirm whether we have them or not. I make it, yeah, I think. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, how can we formalize Karabo's answer? What could go wrong with what she identified that these people make payments, full payments, without having an invoice? What could go wrong? Can we formalize what she said? Like, what's the risk of doing that? Oh, Karabo, you want to formalize it again? Formalize it? Okay, at the end, ne, I think yeah. we will just take those goods for, 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 for themselves, you know, because they've seen that the, the invoices is not the to correspond with whatever that it's on the creator's statement. Okay, so yeah. theft and yeah. yes, so theft might happen that company ends up paying for no goods received, but then what else, guys? Think about yourself. You get a statement from a retailer saying that this is the invoice, but you don't have the invoice, but you pay what they say that you owe them. What could go wrong? What's wrong with that? I think um, we, we we can make it a mistake of overpaying, yes, which will cost the company the company. So the thing that you, they, they they should they should have that that creditors um, statement for to 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 I mean for for, for the account for for the for their books to reconcile. You have the invoice and you have the creditor's statement. Then you 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 balance it at the end of the month. You see, or at the end of the day, you see. Yeah, but then Tandeka, remember now, you just had to answer what could go wrong. So I'm helping you guys that by the time that you have to be writing, make sure that you answer the question. What you are mentioning, you mentioned the the saying that what could go wrong is overpayment, right? Which affects the company um, with whatever flows that they have because now they've overpaid for something that was not even necessary. Um, and then you say full stop. By the time you say that they, what they should do is to have creditors and to have invoice and 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 that's a recommendation. So ensure guys that you answer the required put a full stop you are done okay so now let's look at the solution mm -hmm. so the solution says that before the invoice is paid there's no check to confirm that the purchase is authorized 
or even or even that the goods purchased are of the type used by Del Nino. Okay. So it's just to say that before the invoice is paid, they didn't even check that is this purchase authorized. If nobody checks the above, the risk is that employees might be purchasing goods for themselves. Um, it was Karabu who said this, and have the company pay is significantly, and have the company pay is significantly increased. So having the the company to also pay. And it's that it, it relates to that overpayment, right? And then it's a full stop. So what I'm saying is that don't get into the habit of recommending or saying that this is what needs to be there. They didn't ask you what needs to be there. They asked you what's wrong with what they are doing and why do you think that is the case? Then you answer it and then you put a full stop. Because with auditing, we can get into the habit of writing too much. What would happen is that when you write too much, you end up not finishing your paper. And we end up, what we normally do, we brainstorm while writing and not taking a step back to say that, what is it that they are asking me and have I answered the question? So plan and plan. You see how you guys are on the right track in terms of how you're thinking. You just need to, after thinking all those million things that you're thinking of, ask yourself the question at least two times to say, okay, but then what are they asking me? They're saying, what is it that, I'm, what is it that they are doing wrong or that you're concerned about? And um, why am I saying so? Then you answer, okay? So we're doing it number three. I said I want to make sure we get to number five because how you answer this will also apply to all other cycles that are out there. Or whenever there's a weakness question, this is how you answer. Okay? Number three, using the statements, Stella then makes a list of all creditors and the amounts which are to be paid. No? Makes a list of all the creditors that needs to be paid. The list is passed to Mary. Konjo, who's Mary? Sorry. Mary is the accountant. So she makes the list of all the creditors. Then the list is passed to Mary. Um, who writes out a check? for each creditor under 5,000. So there's the threshold of to say that delegation of authority, Mary can only do whatever under 5,000. But anyway, discussion for another day. So Stella compiles, after getting the statements, she compiles all creditors and then she gives it to Mary. Mary writes out checks for, for each creditor under 5,000. All checks are carefully written out and not and marked not transferable. Mary signs each checks and returns them with the list to Stella. Stella confirms the amounts on the check and there is a check for each creditor on the list under 5,000. So Mary does that exercise of taking each of all those signed checks and she checks the amount that is under 5,000 and they are on the list of creditors. Stella writes the check number to each payment on the list and then mails the checks to the creditors. via a compliment to a PTY limited compliment slip. If the amount to be paid is more than 5,000, is then done by EFT and not by check. All right, I'm summarizing it again. Mary gets all the statements. 
makes a list of creditors. She then passes that list to Mary. Sorry, Rostella. Then she passes it to Mary. Mary writes out all the checks for creditors under 5,000. And then she gives it back to Stella. Stella confirms the amount on the check and that the check, there's a check for each creditor on the list of under 5,000. Then Stella writes a check number next to each payment on the list. And then she mails those checks to the creditors attached in a complement slip. And if any amount is above 5,000, it is paid via EFT and not by check. So what's wrong with this and why? What are your concerns? Um, I give one a shot. Mm -hmm. Yes, Mariga. Okay. Um. Uh, well, there's one uh, that comes to mind. Is the weakness is that there is only one signatory on the checks. Okay. There should be two because that will assist with uh, with payment securities. And then the why is Mary Roosevelt can make the check out out incorrectly and nobody else will will actually see it. Um, mm. Or she can actually pay uh, an incorrect creditor or a fictitious creditor. But I think there's there's others, but I haven't worked out the answers yet, but that one I worked out quickly. Okay, so let's summarize what you said. Number one, what is wrong? From your answer, you're on the right track, so let's look at what is wrong. What are your concerns, rather? That there's only one signatory on the check. Okay, and what could go wrong? That a fictitious creditor can be paid and an incorrect creditor can be paid. Okay, cool. Good, cool. And then anyone else who's got another concern that they have like what worries you about this process or is there anything wrong with this process that they have um on my side um if the an amount is more than five thousand it's paid by eft so who's who's confirming this or who's authorizing the eft Okay. Like, yes. Um, Mary can just create an invoice, or Stella can just create an invoice that is above five thousand for her personal things, and then the bank will just, or the bank or the account will just EFT the amount to him to her. Okay. So, Karabo, I'm gonna do the same thing. What is your concern? Formalize your concern. So you've identified too many things, right? I'm saying that you did well, Ka, brainstorming. So now tell me what is the concern that you have over this whole thing of EFT and amounts being above 5,000? Money can be stolen. That's a reason. Give me your concern. <laughs> 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 can I can I help her? Yeah. Um, it's to have someone to check for the payment on on both sides. Whenever they do, this one is doing something. Someone has to verify, and also this one. And when the other one is doing something, they should verify. They know they don't have to do it on their own because then they can make mistakes. So now, yes, time to on the right track. So now when you're saying they, they, who are these? So tell me your concern using names. Mary. When Mary is doing a transaction, no one is, um, no one is uh, checking the work. And mm -hmm. all on the other side as well, when um, this lady, again, Stella, no one yeah. is also, Mary, yeah, Mary, no one is observing. Okay. And what could go wrong when there's no one reviewing either of their work? 
they can they, they, they we can easily miss the transaction and why what would be an issue with us missing a transaction we can we can pay we can like i'll go back we can we will we will overpay or underpay clients we can lose money in that process okay cool all right then let's go and see and oh hey they had more hey on the previous one but then you guys will look at it <laughs> so let's look at number three so what this means in terms of two point two two point three is that um over and above what we've mentioned there's more answers to it you see how Marike identified one, Tande, um, Karabo, I might be getting her names wrong. But then you guys were participating, so it means that there could be more than one answer, okay? So now number three says that no creditors' journals appears to be kept. Creditors are paid on the strength of an external document, creditor statement only. By having a creditor's ledger, a more accurate record of purchases and payment is maintained. The creditor's ledger can be reconciled monthly to the creditor's statement, and any differences and unusual items can be followed up before payment is made. This is a mouthful, but this goes to show that, as I was mentioning, any document or anything that they use, like a creditor's ledger, understanding why we have it will help you to have this full on discussion about it okay number two there's only one check signatory that's what uh Marika said you see this is a concern you only say there's only one check you done full stop having only one signatory provides inadequate security over the company's bank balance as Mary has access to the checkbook, she is the sole signatory. She can write out the check to fictitious creditors at any time. You get your full mark. Happiness. And you see why I was saying, use people's names. Say Mary. So you know who you're talking about. Number three, Mary does not agree the amounts to be paid to creditors to any supporting document, example, an approved creditor's recon. This increases the risk of invalid payments to creditors as Stella could add fictitious creditors on the list which Mary writes out the check to. All right. Are we okay? Makes sense, right? Then let's go to number four. Almost there. And then we'll look at computerized stuff. Then I'm going back to computerized stuff because last week we were, yeah, borderline. <laughs> to pay creditors over 5,000, so they continue on that EFT one. They will still take Tandeka's answers and then you guys will add more. To pay creditors over 5,000, Mary accesses the electronic funds transfer facility on her computer and compiles a schedule of payments to be made to EFT by EFT to creditors. She obtains this information from the creditors list prepared by Stella. So Mary has access to the thing on her computer. She compiles a list of payments. She obtains this information from the creditors list uh, prepared by Stella. She carefully checks the details, the name of the bank, the branch code, the account number of the creditor to be paid against a hard copy of the listing which she keeps on her creditors. Besides what Tandeka and Karabo said, what else do you see is an issue with what I just mentioned? What gives you worry? What makes your tongue turn a bit with what I just read? Um, 
Mary has access to the EFT facility on her laptop, and she compiles a payment made to the creditors, and then she's using information that she got from Stella. Then she carefully checks the name of the bank details and the branch code and the account number against a hard copy of the listing, which she keeps for all creditors. What concern or what's a problem with that and why? Can I answer? Yes, you may. Uh, I think uh, the problem is that she can make a, a payment at any time to herself. What gave you that indication of saying that she can make that? That's a risk. What gave you that? Um, what in, what indicators are there that that is possible? Because you see, she can just uh, transfer the funds uh, facility on her computer without. Uh, there is also there is no proper documents because when you make a payment, you need to have the attachments. And what are those attachments, Babato? Uh, it's an invoice. Uh, of the supplier so that you know that wh what are you paying for. Okay. Yes. So, you see, I was asking you what and what. So, you were brainstorming now. So, now give me, you identified the risk. So, now formalize your weakness. So, now, what is the problem with what Mary is doing? What is the weakness? Because they're making the EFT without uh, supporting documents. Such as? Uh, such as uh, uh, she obtained information from creditors list. Because she just obtained this information from creditors list prepared by, uh, by Stella. Yeah, so now you are on the right track. So I was just asking <laughs> you what those documents are. Because I'm saying, be as specific. You can't just say attachment or supporting documents. You can say supporting documents, but in brackets, say, for example, one, two. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Ne? Yes, I see. You see what I mean? Yes. Yeah. Uh, okay. Well, I, I'm sorry for using uh, Tswana. Sorry, guys. For example... Creditors are paid on the strength of an external document, but they say what that external document is. Do you guys see what I mean? You can't just say external or supporting or attachments. Uh, yes, say it, but then be able to say what. Ne? Okay. Um, yes, they might have said it here, but then be get a full mark. Cool. Oh, okay. So, okay. all right, let's look at the solution. There is insufficient control over payments made by EFT. In effect, there is only one signature that is required to access the bank accounts, which is true. She is the only person, it's the same thing with the checks. She's the only person who can have access to the bank accounts. That's a problem. EFTs are made without any supporting documents and can be made by Mary at any time or any amount. She's got access to the bank account facility on her laptop. So it means that even at home, she goes with the laptop. She can just do the payment at any time, at any amount, because she doesn't have those supporting documents. The invoices, the creditor statement, the creditor's account. You guys get what I mean. And as you guys have said, nobody checks at any stage during the payment whether the payments are for a valid creditor. Okay. Last one, guys. Almost there. Almost there. Please don't, don't, don't. You're going to look at controls for computerized system and then we will close it down and this is from a graded question it's a graded question so they normally good because they help you to formalize your answers they help you to be able to answer if you're in the exams 
Last one, Stella passes the creditors list to Dean. If Stella is busy, Stella passes the creditors list to Dean as he is, and Dean is who? Another assistant, clerical assistant. Stella passes the creditors list to Dean as he is solely responsible for cash payment. So he's only responsible for cash payment journals. Namely, writing it up, posting transactions to the GL, and reconciling the cash receipts and the payment journal to the bank statement monthly. So Stella takes the creditors list and she passes on to Dean, whose responsibility is passing the cash payment journal, meaning she writes it up post the transaction in the GL, then thereafter reconciles the cash receipts with that payment journal that's been made to also the bank statement monthly. So what's wrong with all of this or what are your concerns? Let's um, think. Yes. Once again, this company seems as if they're trusting their employees when they are delegated by to um, do something, they yeah. no one is, is um, oh. independent reviewing their work. So I would say in this case, the weakness would be there is no review again to what Dan is doing. So, okay, cool. I'm comfortable. You were brainstorming, okay? <laughs> I, I did find my weakness. <laughs> yeah, what is your weakness? There is what? no indep independent reviewer. Yes. Go over what? Over the transaction that um, Dan is making. So it can easily uh, go, go have the, <laughs> the, the, the activities that are not for the correct purposes of the business, maybe buying something for, for himself, recording on that payment, main monitors not supposed to be there, or even the, the invoices that are not um, recorded there, invoice numbers that are not on, they were supposed to be on that payment, but they're not reflecting, something like that. <laughs> okay, cool. Um, let's look. So, no review of the cash book is carried out by management. For example, the cash book is not reviewed for missing check numbers or unusual payments. With no independent review of Dean's work, he has the opportunity to cover misappropriation. Cool, what she said. And almost total lack of involvement by senior personnel with such a small staff and a lack of basic controls, the senior management should be playing an active role. For example, acting as a second signatory on the checks and EFTs or reviewing supporting documentation. This lack of involvement weakens the control environment considerably and facilitates fraud and collusion. This would, I would say 5.2 is an overall general answer. This one was more specific to say it's Dean's work. Uh, can I ask you something? Yes, Babazo. I just want to know when you answer these questions, you need to use uh, this auditing language, eh? Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> so okay. how you learn is you doing more questions. Oh, As okay. I mentioned, when I was doing my postgrad, thank you, Marika. When I was doing my postgrad, things like check, we didn't say check, we said verify and confirm. Oh, okay. So there's a auditing language. It's just that at least with this one, when you're looking at the solutions, they say check, but. Oh. Auditing does have a language. You need to speak about fraud. You need to, to talk about misappropriation of funds. You need to talk about fruitless and wasteful expenditure. Do you guys get what I mean? You need to be specific about the risks that are involved. So with such a question that we were doing, 
you sit down, right? And you identify risks that are within, because we just mentioned risks that are within the payment function of the acquisition and payment cycle. Yes, there are weaknesses, but look at the risks. The risks, they are always almost the same. So you just say, you write down for payment cycle, what are the risks? The risk is that goods can be uh, paid whereby they were never ordered or received or delivered. Goods can be paid whereby they were incorrect in terms of description, quantity, and price. That's a risk. You write mm -hmm. down. Employees might be purchasing goods for themselves. It's a risk. This results in two overpayment by company. It's a risk. Do you guys see what I'm saying? The risks are generic. You write them down, know them by heart, that when it comes to a payment cycle, what could go wrong when certain controls are not there? Incorrect payments can be done. There might be an under-recovery of that. But that's the language that, Babatu, when you're saying that, is there certain, you must be able to articulate it, over-recovery of that, overstatement of this or understatement of that, because we will know that you are able to identify the risk. Okay. Thank you. Don't be too general where you're saying that, yo, uh, now you're telling us a story, you know, Babatu and Marike, might end up taking stock at home. Ah, uh -uh. be summarize it because when you summarize it, that's when you will have enough time to attempt other questions. So you just say, Babatso and Marike might collide and commit fraud. You guys see, so brainstorm but summarize. And how you learn how to have this language on top of things, so or, or on top of um your brain you need to nb nb you need to practice and look at these questions and i would say that you attempt the question as we've been attempting you sit down and you write it out write out your answers get to the solution highlight where you got it right highlight where you almost got it right so you highlight with different colors well, you got it right is where it's almost the same. So you just say green. And then where you almost, you say, but I was almost there. That's the yellow highlighter. Where you got it all wrong, you highlight it with red. Then you start asking yourself, what makes the difference on the ones that are yellow? What makes the difference between my answer and their answer? What is it that I didn't get right? What, what didn't hit the nail? You then start seeing where your issues are. Where it's red, you go back to the theory, you read it again, because that means that there's certain things about the theory that you don't know. I'm just giving you tips as to how to attempt and learn how to answer for audit, because most people, they fall under yellow, where you were almost there, but you were not there. This is when you didn't answer the question. Or you spoke a lot, but you didn't summarize and hit the nail straight. And talk about theft, talk about fraud, talk about, do you guys get what I mean? Yeah. Um, uh, uh, yes. Tandega. Oh, okay. I was going to ask how many, are we writing for how many hours and is it the written exam or a multiple choice? Let me show you past papers that I have. I hope you guys can still see my screen. So it's 100 marks and it's for two hours. I'm just saying these are past papers. This is based on prior, previously. I don't think that they've changed. And to look at the question, you will see that first one, it's corporate governance and internal controls. It's 50 marks. That's one hour. Then it's acquisition. They'll tell you which cycle are they testing. It's acquisition, payment cycle, which is the one that we're looking at now. 
There's inventory and production cycle. We'll look at it next week. Payroll and personnel, 50 marks. What type of questions do you have? You have, it's not multiple questions. They actually ask you questions, yeah. You describe, you identify, you match this and that. Then you go to question two. Same thing, you, you must answer the question. You describe, you talk, you talk, but it's 50 and 50. And then um, computerized system is similar to what we spoke about last week, whereby there are systems involved. Yes, there's still people, but the systems are the things that does the work. So there's the input, there's the process, and then there's the output um, within that system. Input is you typing in and getting certain details in, and then the pr process is in between before it says that your order has been made or this payment has been made, right? So people who are working in accounting, the SAP, there's other facilities that, I mean, not facility systems that we use to make those payments. In terms of making an order, think about take a lot, for instance. You make an order or it's micro or other companies that we have where you make an order, what are those systems? What are the things that they ask you when you're making the order? What do you get once you're done and complete with the order? And with a computerized environment, you need to understand that you have to ask yourself, whatever that I'm doing, is it ensuring that there's accuracy? Is it ensuring that there's authorization and there's completeness? So eight says that answer the following questions regarding application controls over a bank account. So they're telling you specifically over what? A bank account. Why do you think it's important to restrict access to a bank account in a computerized system? Why is that important, guys? Um, I think it's the, what's the word? Is, 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 is to end like people to hold them accountable so like if everyone has access to it then who account for what i think um for control measures pardon i think it is for control measures what kind of control measures why do you think what why do you want to res restrict access to a bank account uh, you mean a personal bank account or a business bank account? It's a business account. Right. In the business account. Okay, let's wait for 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 Nelson to finish. Uh, in a business account, I think it, it, it is uh, like one of the control measures to have an ac uh, a pin to access a bank account so that we know, we restrict. Yeah, it is to restrict uh, um, entry or to restrict access into the bank account. Why? So you gave me the controls. Yes. But I want to know why. If that control is not there, what could happen? A lot could go wrong. Um, everyone can just go um, go into the bank account and do as they please. There can be theft of cash. There can be mismanagement of cash overall. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it, I think it's best to have a, a pin. Okay, so mismanagement of cash. All right, cool. Others? Beneficiaries can be deleted or changed. And what would happen if that's the case? Well, the data is then incorrect. Well, I, yeah, I don't... I'm, it's... <laughs> yeah, I know. You guys must get to have it. I'm, I'm forcing you. Yes, beneficiaries can be changed, but what happens when beneficiaries are changed? What What's wrong with that? Then it's either you can pay yourself or then the incorrect, yeah, or mm. that the, the correct beneficiary will definitely not be paid or a total stranger will be paid. Yeah. <laughs> it is. It is. So you see, that's the risk. And then any other, 
other reason why it's important to restrict access to a bank account in a computerized system? Guys, in a computerized system, why? What normally happens in computerized system on like generally? Maybe data can be. Hey, I need to use this uh, auditing language. Uh, that I can be. They can steal data. Yeah, and who's they? Anyone, an authorized uh, user. Yeah, a hacker. A hacker, yes. Mm. You see why it's important for us to practice? Yes. Yes. It's very important for you to practice this language. But you guys are on the right track. Um, Violation of access to the bank account in a computerized system can have extremely serious consequences for a business, and this includes destruction of data. The internet bank account itself or the account details can be deleted. That's like a problem. There might be theft of data. Bank account details could be stolen and abused. Improper changes to the data. Payment beneficiary details could be changed in order to channel payments to unauthorized accounts. Remember, Marika, we are saying that what's the problem with changing beneficiaries to channel those payments to unauthorized accounts? Like you're saying, people can pay for themselves. Recording of unauthorized or non existing transactions could happen. Unauthorized transfers of the money can be done. Know the risks. I'm telling you guys, know the risk. You don't want a situation whereby these four marks can go to waste. Because some of the questions inside your exam paper, sometimes they just have a small, sorry, description about bank accounts in a computer system. Then out of the blue, you get a four mark asking you, why is it important for us to restrict access to a bank account? You don't want to get to a point where you're scrambling for answers. Know the answers on top of your head as to what could go wrong when there is unlimited access to the bank account. All right. And think about a computerized system, loss of the, and, and be specific by who and what could happen if that happens. If there's theft of data, of, of data, take it a bit further to say, and and then what? So always have that question, so what? If I have a theft of data, so what? Bank details can be stolen and abused. That's the risk. You, you, you guys, I hope you guys understand what I'm saying. Changes to the data, i.e. beneficiary details. Okay, and then take it a bit step further to say this might happen. Then you hit the you hit you 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 nail it. So I'm saying refrain from being amber or yellow by saying theft of data. Take it a step further where you get a green and a four mark. Okay, describe the access control access controls that should be implemented to ensure that there is sound controls over a bank account. What are access controls to a bank account? Think about your internet banking and your bank account. What are those controls that are there to make sure that there is sound controls over your bank account? For one, um, only the people that is authorized to release the payments must have the banking app. You know, if, well, I'm going to use the word app. I must have, can have the, the banking app loaded on the terminal or PC or laptop. They are the only authorized users. So you're saying that we must have authorized people to the bank account? Certain, uh, okay, for instance, for example, 
if you have, if this company has got, uh, has two authorized people, let's say the, the CFO and the financial manager, then they only must have access to the, to the, to the bank and they are the only ones that that, yeah, that has the banking app on their PCs and nobody else. Okay. And with this, all right, so number one. And number two, can they have access whenever, whatever? What else can you guys say over and above that? Um, okay. Yeah. Can I can I go again? Um, for instance, with uh, with where I work, uh, we use two different banks to do banking. Mm. So um, on and on both banks, they have you have your user, uh, your well, it's like a the normal. I'm going to say the the normal username, and then there is a password. But then as soon as you are logged in, there is like a token or uh, a, a pin that gets sent to your cell phone. Mm. Yes, to give user you authentication. Yeah, user authentication pin. Yes, yes. Oh, I must also get used to this, to the auditing language. Yes, user, user authentication. Yes, there we go. <laughs> yes, all right. I like that. I like that's what I'm saying. Think about you when you have your when you're trying to gain access to your bank account. What are the controls that you see? Do you go in directly or how does it work? What other controls, guys? When you try open your app, don't you guys use internet banking? Yes, we do. We do. So what's okay, going there's on? a pin. <laughs> you, you need to put in a pin. <laughs> <laughs> yes. You only put in a pin. Is that a pin? What pin is this? <laughs> okay. Let's look at the hands, guys, too. All right, so <laughs> the access controls, and I'm not laughing at you, I'm just saying you must think practically, right? So they're saying the access controller should be implemented to ensure that the sound controls over the bank account are, number one, the terminal onto which the bank software is loaded should be in the creditor section and will only be the terminal of the senior creditor's clerk. So it's what Marika was saying. There must be, but it's a terminal. There must be a specific terminal which has the bank software and it should be the terminal of the senior clerk. Access to the bank site should be gained in the normal manner, but to access the bank account, the senior creditor should need to enter a pin and password that's what i wanted what type of pin is this so you say user authentication pin and password if this identification and authentication procedure is successful a menu of the functions available should be displayed one of which will be download a bank statement guys this is what's on the internet banking is it not? That's what I was saying, that when you go into the site, do you just go in? No, you don't. Before you see everything else, you need to they try to get an identification and that procedure first to make sure that it's successful. And then thereafter, that's when you will have access to the functions that are within that internet banking. This function should be linked to the senior creditors click user profile to enable them to initiate to download. How many marks? Four marks. Guys, know your controls. And I'm seeing a habit now that with the previous um, 
since we started with controls, you guys are very strong when it comes to, when I say guys, I'm including all genders, please excuse my term. You, you, you are all strong when it comes to the manual controls, but when it comes to computer controls, you get a bit stuck. Try to know your application controls because they will come out. You don't want to have to think once, twice, three times while you're in the exam. In the exam, it's all about game plan. Knowledge will be there. Practice would have been done. It's now time for you to perform. So when it's time for you to perform, you don't second guess. You go on what you've built. You don't build in the exam. Build first at home and also in the tasks that we are having. Then by the time you get to the exam, you must know how and what is your game plan. These are type of questions where you're saying it's easy marks. Let me start with the easy marks. Okay. All right. Number three. This is very, very important. You must know it. It's about eight. Just reminds me of my postgrad. Always knew the eight. The eight controls. Then you know that I am scoring as much as I can. Provide a list of sound controls over passwords as part of access controls of a bank account. You tell me, when you're doing your passwords, what do they normally ask you guys and ladies? Now you need to Secu Security questions. Security questions like what? <laughs> mm, maybe they will ask, do you have a... Those I don't know what those questions they they call, but they your pet name, your yes. high school. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Security questions. Uh, number two. Um, sometimes the well, they 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 will want like the password itself to have like different characters in it, not just to name characters like what. Um, like your your hash and stars and numbers and capital letters and lowercase and upper. What? Yeah, that. Good. Number three. Email address. Pardon? Email address. What about the email address? Um, you need to have an email address uh to confirm. Yeah. When you are doing a password, think again. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> You're talking about creating a user profile. I'm talking about password. Yeah. Okay. Number three. And then also, you can, you are not supposed to use uh, the obvious, uh, like uh, your birthdays. Mm. Uh, maybe the name of your kids. Mm. Uh, even if maybe sometimes you'll want to uh, type backwards, sometimes they can be able to get it because it's too easy. Yeah. So you shouldn't use the common words. Nice one. Five. Passwords must be changed regularly. How often? At least once a month. At least once a month. Cool. Seven. You should not write your um, your password down uh, on a piece of paper or in a book or in your diary or um, so save it as a sticky note on your laptop or your screen or something. It mustn't be uh, seen by, by anyone. Accessible. Cool. Eight. Uh, I don't know if um, my colleagues have also answered that it should not share your password to anyone. Yeah, don't share. And then sometimes length, what's the minimum sometimes? Don't it's, they tell you like how how many? 
It's usually mm-hmm. the minimum of six, isn't it? Yeah, six to eight. Eight, right? eight thing is. Eight. Yes, cool. So here they are, and these are like more than eight. Password to access the bank account should be unique. Group password should not be used. Passwords to access a bank account should consist of at least six characters. You see? Be random. And you see, like, you're specific. Be specific. Don't think that we know. We don't. At least six characters. Be random. Not obvious. You guys mentioned that. A mix of letters. You see, upper or lower case and symbols. They call them symbols, guys. Numbers. Passwords and user IDs for terminated or transfer senior creditors should be removed or disabled at the time of the termination of the transfer. It's very important. People can't have access, right? Passwords to access the bank account should be changed regularly. And uh, system sends the senior clerks a screen message to change the password and allows a limited number of attempts to enter the existing password. After this, access will not be granted and a new password should be granted. I mean, should be registered. How often does that happen, guys? A lot. Well, you come in and it says incorrect and then you have to do a new one. The first time a new clerk accesses the bank account, he should be prompted to change the initial password. Password access should not be displayed or any PCs at any time. Be printed on what Marek was saying. Password files should be subject to strict controls to protect them for unauthorized read and write access. Encryption is important. Password should be changed if confidentially has been violated. Password should not be obvious. You see, for example, you mentioned them, birthdays, names, names being backwards, exactly what you said, common words. Write that. Senior clerks should be prohibited from disclosing and sharing it with others. We've mentioned that. Password should... Uh, should be changed if confidentiality has been violated, violation is expected, and it should not be obvious they're repeating themselves. Okay, so about eight, then you know that you have demolished the paper. You start with the obvious when you're doing such, because i rather start with this, knowing that it boosts my confidence. It's something that I can think of very quickly than to start with the one of weaknesses and risk, if you get what I mean. Because there you have to think, you need to apply yourself, you need to look at the documents, you need to look at who's doing what, you need to be able to summarize and say that what is the issue here and what is the risk. So start with the questions that you know that there are you don't have to think twice. You don't have to think a lot. It's easier. It's quick. It's going to boost your confidence. Then you move to the ones where you have to think, and it takes a bit a while for you to, to do them. All right. Any questions? You've got six minutes. So I'm going to ask you. Another one that I wanted us to do, okay? During the internal audit of acquisitions and payment cycle, the following weaknesses related to the payment of creditors by EFT were identified. So now look at it. The previous question, we were mentioning what the weaknesses are. In this instance, they're saying, here are the weaknesses. So chances are they might ask you about risk or recommendations. I haven't looked at the question. I'm just thinking, why am I always preempting? Because when you're writing your board exam or when you're doing your CTA, you have to, they don't tell you that this is audit. 
they don't tell you what the, you need to get to the habit of preempting your questions. By the time the questions come, you're not shocked. That's why. But anyway, it takes practice and time. So let's pick number two. It looks like it's a full one. And then we answer, then we close the class. The creditor's clerk will access the prepare, the prepare payment module to prepare the EFT schedule of payments. After which he will select the proceed option. The creditor section head will then access the prepare payment model and review the schedule for reasonability. The creditor section head will also make any changes he deems necessary. That is the weakness, right? Then the question is, for each of the weakness that we just identified, describe. Describe means you must identify and explain. So you need to describe one internal control that our law should implement in order to address the weakness. And that's the format. You say what the weakness is, you say you gain mark for saying the control and explaining it. So now what, what control can this creditors click and the creditors section head have to address this weakness? Or oh, you don't see any weakness, guys. Let's talk. The creditors click has access to the payment, payment model, prepares the EFT schedule. After that, select proceed. Then the head comes in has access to the to the model. They review the schedule to check reasonability. Then the head has access to make any changes he deems necessary. What controls can there be for this whole EFT situation, guys? Before the before they should before payment is made, uh, documents should be signed. By who? By the senior clerk or supervisors okay and what are the some of those documents that you are mentioning uh the invoice mm. the invoice P, uh, the purchase order and the grn should all match together okay cool so let's look at it the creditor section head should compare the payment schedule to any relevant supporting documents. So, for example, run a report to assist them in his review before approving it, not just review for reasonability. So, you are right, Naive, right? Or the creditor section should not have a right access to the payment schedule. I thought you guys will mention this. And any changes required should be referred back to the creditor's clerk. So do you guys see that what I was trying to illustrate with this question, if we have time next week, we might look at it. If not, we'll look at it when we are doing our, our revisions. What happens on the computerized system is almost similar to what happens in the manual thing. Just because it's online and it's just there. Um, it's in a computerized software. It doesn't mean that they don't have to review or check against um, supporting documents that Naeem mentioned. So the same thing happens. And last week we spoke about the master file or, yeah, we were talking about the master file. You can't just make any changes out of the blue as you deem necessary just because you are the head. There needs to be something that supports you having to change that. Ideally, you should not be just making changes to what's in the master file because they, they could change bank accounts, they can change customer names, they could change anything because they have the powers to authorize. So what you do, you make sure that within this system of making payments, no one has the right to, uh, no one has access to write or change any of the details so that was the class for today i hope you guys learned something when it comes to application controls i'm still saying 
go back, read them, own them, try to make examples that are applicable to your lifestyle because it's easier to think about application controls because that's what you face every single day. You make orders online, you attend class online, everything is online. So try to think that before I access a bank account, what are the things that I face? Make it applicable to a company. If not, I still say that you can find um, some, some uh, videos online, like on YouTube, to say application controls over creditors or over this, so that they can make practical examples for you. Make them practical, because it will be easier for you to, to know what to think of, what to check, what needs to be done before a certain process or task is done. And then you practice, you write, write the answers and then mark, as I've said, yellow if you are you were almost there, red if you got it wrong, and green. Yellow, you spend time to ask yourself, what is it that it might have been a language thing? It might be a thing of you didn't answer the question. It might have been that you, you were almost there. So find out why you were not there. Red, you go back to the textbook, you read the theory, you come back, you attempt further questions. That's it for today, guys.